Alrighty, well, we might get started. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third instalment of our Wormwise webinar series organised by Northern Table and Local Land Services. Um, for those of you who missed last week's webinars, my name is Brianna Carney and I'm a Land Services Officer based out of Armadale, but servicing the entire Northern Tablelands region. Our presenter for this series is Dr Nigel Brown, who is a formal, former LLS District Veterinarian based out of Glen Innes. Many of you joining us tonight may have come across Nigel and know that he's quite the guru when it comes to all things worm management. Um, once again, I just have some housekeeping before we kick off for those of you joining us for the first time. So by default, your microphone and camera will be off, so you should be able to hear and see us, but we won't be able to hear you. There is a Q&A icon at the top of your screen, so if you have any questions, please pop them in there, or you can put them in the chat, and hopefully we'll have some time to address those at the end of the session. This webinar is also being recorded, so it should be available for you to view in the next couple of days. So without further ado, once again, please welcome Nigel, who will tonight be presenting on scourworms. So thank you, Nigel, and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Bree. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Nice to be here chatting with you again. Had a bit of fun pulling this little uh, presentation together for you. Um, and that original picture, we, you may recall, was from the old Yoni's disease days, when, well, I say the old days, when we kept trying to keep it out of the region. Um, I'm going to start tonight by looking at the digestive system of sheep rather than going straight into the diseases because shit is shit is shit, but you get runny shit and dry shit. And it's the effects of whatever disease is causing it that allows it to be runny. So what I'm wanting to do is just remind you that the sheep eats this grass at this end, puts it into the rumen and the reticulum comes back up again for a bit of chewing the cud and goes back down to the rumen again. So if that grass is really moist and juicy in early springtime, lush, that will just by itself be putting more fluid into the system in here. And when it puddles on through the abomasum, small intestine and large intestine, the body is not able to reabsorb all that fluid, and so it comes out runny from the back end. Fair enough. That's a very simple logistics problem. In general, with when in feces is normal, the food goes into the rumen, is chewed up, and then it passes through the omasum before it gets to the abomasum. And in the abomasum, it's the digestive stomach, a bit like our own stomach, puts out hydrochloric acid, digestive juices, and so forth. And that's where some really severe worm problems can kick in. Because some of these nasty worms that we get, like the brown stomach, they will damage the lining of the abomasum. They will get into the gastric glands that line it. They will reduce the amount of acid that's being produced. They will reduce the amount of enzymes that are being produced. And we will get much impairment of the digestion instead of what should happen. That means that the uh, ingester, as it's called, that goes on down in through the, the duodenum, on through the small intestine, is already abnormal before it starts. But now we find, unlike the barber's pole worm that we talked about at the end last week, a lot of these other parasites now are spreading down the first two, three feet into meters heading on down the small intestine. And so we're getting similar damage to that small intestine. And the small intestine is also producing enzymes, especially those that come in through the pancreas. So there's more digestion going on there. Then there is some ab absorption of goodness into the body through the small intestine. But the bulk 
of the absorption is going to go on in the large intestines. And even there, we get worms which will be damaging that. So in really bad cases of worms, we will see that there is damage down the length of the tract. Now, some of that damage will repair, but some with some worms, and I don't intend to give you all the fine details, some of those, the damage is nigh on permanent, added to which some of these worms in the intestines especially are really painful and uncomfortable. And just that discomfort reduces the amount of food that the animal is going to eat because of, let's say, colic, abdominal pain that they are feeding. So that's really important to understand as well as we go through. And Having said that about worms, we will then find that if we look at some of these other differential diagnosis, the other things that can cause the problems, here's the list of some of the worms that we could be talking about. Um, and we, we, they can all upset different parts of that tract and lead to the scouring problem. However, if we look at this other list of diseases that we've got that could cause similar scouring, we've got bacterial diseases, things like Yersinia, Yoni's disease, right? Chronic Yoni's disease, it thickens the bowel wall so much that the fluids that are coming down from the stomach can't be uh, reabsorbed. We've got viral diseases. There's some real nasty ones in there that, that can actually, some of them are exotic, that can cause really bad diarrhea. Then we've got protozoas. So the things that we've got in the way of protozoas, uh, they could be a crypto, um, spiridia and things like that, that are going to be uh, a, a, a common feature. Then there's other things like Giardia. So bacteria, as we've talked about, you see, I nearly forgot Salmonella. We don't see it that much, but we can do. Then we've got Entrotoxemia. So that's where toxins produced by various bacteria then poison the gut. And, and so we've got some of those could even be clostridial ones. Then we've got chemicals and salt, not that salt toxicity is a major problem. I've mentioned feed problems with overgrazing of the rich, uh, lush pasture. But how many of you have never seen a case of uh, rumen acidosis where they've overgorged on grain? That will cause diarrhea. And then things like the selenium deficiency will cause it. And then there are other things like, oh, let's say cancers that can mimic um, very thin animals could mimic Yoni's disease, seeing quite a few in my time of those. So having mentioned now that there's a lot of things that it's very difficult often to work out what the cause is, You've got to start off with your clinical examination of your animals and your flock. So what is the number that are affected in your mob? Is it a single animal or is it quite commonly at varying stages through the whole mob? What age are the animals? Some of these parasites affect younger because we've already heard the younger animals have less immunity. What, what's their history? What have you given them in the way of mineral treatment? So can you rule out selenium at a stroke? Have you wormed them with a, a known effective treatment recently? All those parts of the history. What time of year and the weather is it? Is it if it's midwinter? winter, it, you're looking at different problems to if it's spring. Have you done any worm egg counting? I've already gone on about that before. What sort of body weight and score have we got? Have you opened any up? I mean, you know by now, I am love to recommend that you open up dead animals, get the most you can from them. And, and then you can talk knowledgeably to your LLS and other professional supporters. Here's a range of pickies and it, 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 of 
the different eggs of some of these worms. Look how similar these ones along the bottom are. They're strong aisle eggs. You potentially can't pick up until you really experience which one is which because they are so similar. So what do they do in the labs? They culture those, grow the larvae out from there, and then it's much easier to distinguish one larva from another. So the larva out of this egg will be distinguishable from the one out of this egg or this egg. This nematodirus, which strictly speaking is a strong girl, is much bigger here. So that's obvious if you see those. And these coccidia, look how many different sizes there are amongst these. We won't worry too much about these larvae here, but I just wanted you to, to see that it, it, they don't come with the name written on when you look down the microscope. You need a bit of skill to have a look at them. Here's that life cycle. Uh, again, let's not worry too much about that. You've seen that before, all pretty bog standard. A few days on the ground and then three weeks coming through the system. However, what does become more critical with this is this inhibition. So the L3 larvae come in through the mouth. Uh, the L4 can form a cyst. And here is a, 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 a histopathological smear. You can see the, the uh, lining of the intestine with these villi, which do the absorptions. And they've got increased finger-like processes uh, to increase the surface area. But down in the bottom, where the glands, where the acid comes, and that's where these insisted larvae go. And that means that if the, there's not much grass out there, the conditions are not ripe, it's cold, these larvae can form cysts which stay there until the conditions get better. And those conditions getting better could be lush grass, it could be pregnancy, late pregnancy, because we've talked about this lowering of resistance of the U in late pregnancy, which lasts through till about the weaning of the lamb. And that means that their innate resistance is down. So then, wow, these larvae take the opportunity to hatch out and you've got vast numbers of them doing damage to the lining of the intestine and causing diarrhea as I've explained and here's the catch ladies and gentlemen you look at a worm sample or the feces sample for worm eggs and there aren't any or very few. And why is that? Because these are immature larvae that are breaking out. They're not laying any eggs. And that's going to confound you in lots of cases. So here's my worm egg counts. I think I showed you this last time. I know I did. And it's just a, a, a sort of a, a rough guide as to the daily egg production. So here you've got Barber's Pole, 10,000 eggs. But look at that. Your brown stomach is only producing 50 to 100 eggs eggs per day, less than 100 for that nematodirus. Now, if you're looking at your worm egg counts, you, for a nematodirus, you could be finding three or four eggs only and yet have a significant worm burden. That's another topic for another talk. But that's just to give you an idea of, of the importance. And just as a um, as a note, I, I've mentioned tapeworms and liver flukes here. Oh, there's a typo. Um, liver flukes and, and stomach flukes both give about two to 4,000 eggs per day. And these ta tapeworm segments, look at that, five to eight segments a day, 100,000 eggs each segment. But we'll come on to that probably a bit later. Look at those egg counts there, the sort of cutoff points. That's the sort of figure two to 500. Every property is going to use its own and depending on whether it's got wieners or dry sheep, which is going to be important. Um, but that's just, again, a bit of a guideline. So let's look at this small brown stomach worm. This picture here basically is showing all those cysts 
on the lining um, and these are the ones they're visible to the naked eye and those are where those larvae are going to come through it's a real real problem in in cattle uh, when large numbers of them come through in say the autumn so that's really the uh the issue there with those ones and and of course you can get everything from scouring and ill thrift uh, where they're just not thriving through to to death and 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 look at these figures here at the bottom um on the the losses of weight gain that you can get with 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 what they call subclinical infection. And that's one where you don't really know. They're just not thriving. 35% wool growth down by 20%, milk production by 20%, and you don't even know it's going on. And that's significant, not only to your pocket, but to the lambs that are, are, are not getting the milk, not getting a good start in life. When we look at the brown, the black scourworm, that's called the trichostrongo, several different sorts of that. Um, but again, it, it's found in all sheep areas and it causes black sort of scarring at the, at the back end. But it's not alone in that. There are other things that cause that. Um, and you could get rapid loss of condition with a heavy infestation. But again, major, major issues um, with subclinical that you, you can't actually put your finger on it. And, and do note here the comment that I'm making that, that mixed infections are going to happen. They're not going to be just brown scar, stomach or black scar worms. There's going to be a mixture. And it always seems from the Clinic, clinician's point of view, that the mixture of infections is going to be worse than a pure one. So when you've got a, a pure infection in a lab, the disease is nowhere near so, so bad. But both of those can burrow into the walls of the, of the uh, gut and cause problems. Now, one of the common problems, especially in the younger animals, is this thing called coccidia. Is Imeria species and Cryptosporidia type, they're very, very common, and you'll find those in worm um, samples that you analyze and are analyzed by labs. Um, they're those little ones. They're not a worm. They are a, a protozoa, an organism. Um, and there is a general age immunity, but they are very common. And the classical thing that we find with with the coxie is that they're brought on by stress when whatever immunity is there is reduced. So a change of the weather, long prolonged wet weather, sheep grazes warning type stuff could cause major, major problems. It causes a lot of loss and, but you will see bl usually bloody scours. So the, the damage to the intestine and you, here we are in the middle here, you can see little cysts, but you can see the damage is bloody and red and um, will will cause a lot of dehydration. The, the life cycle is direct, so they, they're shitting on the ground. So keeping them in yards, in, in a feedlot situation um, is a real problem. It's a big problem in goats as well, where goats are grazing on the ground in pens. Uh, they commonly go down with it. Now, I can't go past black scour and not mention the stomach fluke. This is, is not quite the same as the liver fluke. It's a paramphistone. If you open up the rumen, you can see it's this one with the honeycomb. And here are the, the well, here are the organisms in there. They're all centimetres sort of long. Um, here's one by itself. And they're a bit like a horn with a little hollow at one end rather than the flat anchor fluke of, of the liver fluke. We do get these in this area. Uh, more common in cattle, but uh, a few years ago, or maybe four years ago now, I was seeing quite a fair bit in uh, sheep, black scour. Um, the only thing that will touch it is nilzan. Um, and 
nothing else seems to touch it and and so but you have to be careful about it you never eradicate it it like uh, the liver fluke uh, comes through from uh, snails and here, oh, here's the picture of the life cycle and it has this planorbid snail which is a bit like a ram's horn um, type snail as opposed to this lower one which is the one that carries the liver fluke they live in sort of similar uh, areas the the uh, this one needs a bit more of an active stream than the boggy wet marshy area and they have a complicated lifestyle won't go into that because i'm talking about liver fluke tomorrow and we'll go into that in more detail but it does happen and you won't pick up their eggs the uh, the stomach fluke eggs in an ordinary smear because they're too big to float in the salt you have to look specifically for them it's just a bit of a warning tapeworms mentioned tapeworms very obvious but you know in general they do not cause much pathological damage people say ah i treated them and they went away and the sheep got better but it's usually because they treated another causal problem in the gut rather than the tapeworm and um uh, so I, I but we do mention it but don't get sucked into buying something just because you've got a few tapeworm segments there you can see the life cycle uh, here if you if you actually look is that there's these little grass mites that eat the eggs of the tapeworm and then they develop in the grass mite and then the grass mite gets eaten by the sheep so it's got that two stage to its life cycle um, but the, the, that sort of tapeworm is not the problem there are other of course tapeworms that cause cysts in muscles but we're not talking about those ones today let's move on to the next one we're here we're talking about grazing management so you've got to understand it's the same procedures as we've talked about before understanding the exposure of the eggs how uh, how much uh, sunlight dry length of grass etc is going to be there we certainly do get uh, drench resistance just as much or more than some of the the uh, barber's pole um, but uh, that's something again to be to be to be warned about chemical controlled again today it's got to be much more based on management avoid bringing resistant worms onto the farm minimize your selection for re for resistant worms and again we're still talking about using combination drenches so you know your dredge activity on your property so hopefully they'll all be above 95 percent and you could do that by checking 14 days after you've drenched to see what level of activity is there. And I mentioned before, think about if you drench today, those worms that are just ahead of the drench or the eggs that have been laid just ahead of the drench will still be coming out for the next few days. So if you move straight out of the yard onto a killing paddock, that paddock will become contaminated. So you could move back on to the original paddock for a couple of days. And that's where you've got to know which, how long the drench that you've given is actually going to remain active for. Um, so that uh, and, and most of them will have some activity going on. They don't just sort of hit everything that's there now and then pass out of the out of the system like a, a, the glucose in a mass bar. The, the, the whole thing is there and active into the system, but it does vary. And so that's what you need to know. Resistance, resilience. Now, there is a fair scud of, of, of ability. I haven't really mentioned it before, but I'm going to just take a moment today to say that not all sheep are going to be producing the same number of eggs. We tend to think that that's what's going to happen, but they're not. Some of these sheep are going to have low resistance, resilience to the to the um, to the the worms, so they're they're going to be able to fight off and lower the egg production. One of the beautiful things that you can do is to identify those animals that never thrive, that are always 
poor because they are likely to be the ones that are laying more eggs and contaminating more pasture. And if you learn the ability to do your worm egg counting yourself, um, then you can test those individual animals and say, well, she never does. Well, let's do an egg count and compare her with that one or that one. And, and, and you can really hone in. And that's one of those great beauties of doing your own worm egg count. Nutritional, I can't go past mentioning selenium, but using the protein and energy, keeping that up to them is again critical in uh, managing because it's so much better to have the, the sheep fighting the worms themselves than for you to be giving them um, drenches all the time. There's no there's no drench resistance or pellet resistance uh, if you give them more pellets as there is to drenches. Look, I'm not going to read through the essentials of drenching. I'm just leaving it there for you to read at the moment. Those are pretty bog standard recommendations. I, I'm sure Brianna can, can send you a copy if you actually wanted a, a, a printout of that. But but it's 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 very, very easy to 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 list those and just get into the routine of of, of doing everything yourself. So Let's finish off with those take home messages. Well, I was going to, but they don't seem to want to come on. Oh dear. So don't guess, use modern science, test your routine, your feces routinely, and basically do your own science and, and, and make, do your own research. So in egg counting, clinical examinations, and do your post-sportives. 14 days after you've done the trenching, the drenching, do a test, and link with professional advisors. There we are. That's my thoughts on that topic. I hope they're of use. Thanks, Nigel. Um, before we wrap up, I did have one question. Um, just circling back to the resistance and resilience side of things. Um, as far as I know, there's no ASBV specifically for resilience. Um, there is for resistance. Um, you can select for WEX. How would you go about breeding for resilience? As in, would you look at production perf production performance um, and relate that to their worm egg count? So perhaps one that has a high ASBV per worm egg counts but performs well versus one that doesn't. And is there perhaps a benefit to selecting for resilient animals versus resistant animals, if that makes sense? <laughs> yep, yep. Look, I, I think that's a, a really um, challenging question. I totally agree with you that, that that I don't think we can yet identify the resilience component. But I think this is where if you're trying to get somebody else to identify which are the resilient ones in your flock, <laughs> You know, it costs you an arm and a leg to get somebody in. You can do it yourself. You can weigh them. You can body score. You can do your um, worm egg counts to at set times to compare and contrast individuals that are going there and say, well, these ones, you know, in this period of time, I've got them all weighed through. I mean, three years ago, was it? I went along to a property and they'd got they'd got a beautiful, and that's only because I haven't been on many properties since. They had a beautiful setup where whereby the sheep were weighed automatically as they came along the race. It, they were just flowing smoothly, and then the drench gun was automatically calibrated with the amount of drench that that animal weighed. It, the animals were identified. We all know electronic um, uh, ID is coming in. We're not going to argue that in the next 30 seconds, but it's coming in. Take every advantage of it and think about getting that mechanism, which makes your life so much easier, where you can then start selecting and cull off the ones that aren't doing you any favors. And the moment you've got electronic ID, you'll be you'll be a step away from following those bloodlines on down and getting the sons and daughters of those or the daughters of those ones to to improve both whether both those that have been tupped by this particular low fecal egg count ram or not so yes there's it, it's just another area for really great work we've we we know 
that that drenches are coming on very very slowly in the way of new ones if we pay if we continue to rely on them you're going to go out of sheep if you've got to think of other ways absolutely thanks nigel um, well, that just about brings us to the end of our time. Um, so I'd just like to thank you all again for joining us tonight. And, of course, uh, once again, a big thank you to you, Nigel. Um, as before, if you'd like further information about any of the topics covered tonight or if you have any other questions that you think of, please don't hesitate to get in touch. You can contact me or any one of our officers in the Northern Tablelands. Um, so our final segment of the webinar series is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. where Nigel will take us through liver fluke management in shape. So please, if you haven't registered for that yet, please go ahead and do so so you don't miss out. Um, thanks, everyone, and I'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks. Bye, yeah. everybody. Bye.